Welcome to another episode of The Motion. <laughs> Are you ready? Yeah, yeah. I got you in the middle of the sip. How's the coffee? It was so good. Alhamdulillah. Couldn't resist. All right. Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Welcome to another episode of the Mosho podcast, episode 67 with Iman, who flew in this morning uh, from Riyadh. Iman, thank you for coming on the show. How have you been? Tell us a little bit about yourself. Thank you for having me. Really excited to be here. Um, recently moved to Riyadh, like the rest of everyone from Jeddah, but it's an exciting time. Um, my name is Iman Abdul Shakur. I also go by Iman Shakur, like how you pronounced my name so graciously. And uh, in a nutshell, I coined myself a neuroscience researcher turned techpreneur or multi passion entrepreneur. I dabble in a lot of different things, mainly investment, startups, in the inclusivity space, and I'm excited to uh, share more of my story today. What put you on the front cover of Entrepreneur Middle East magazine? Primarily my work with, uh, I founded a company called Blossom Accelerator. We're now six years in, um, and essentially, so I started one of the very first accelerators in Saudi Arabia. And uh, for those who don't know, Blossom is Saudi's first female-focused and tech-inclusive accelerator. And for those who don't know what an accelerator is, we basically have programs, all kinds of innovation programs, including accelerators, incubators, hackathons, and we empower startups and SMEs to really start, scale, and succeed. Um, so we work a lot with startups, helping them get investment, curating investment opportunities for them. We're vertical agnostic, and we've always had um, a focus on inclusivity, you know, driving inclusive innovation. I started the company back in 2017. Before How old were you? I was 23 and a half. I 23 and a half. I had yeah. a feeling that you're under 30 mm -hmm. and you said you started this company six years ago. So you must have started off as a fresh grad. Yeah, um, yeah pretty much. So I graduated college. I was 21. And then after college, I worked in clinical drug trials uh, with Paracel and Pfizer Pharmaceuticals. Mm -hmm. Um, and I did start two startups before this one. And I've always been super ambitious. And also all throughout college, I worked. Um, where, was, where was college? I went to school at UC San Diego. Beautiful city. Gorgeous. Amazing. Uh, I, I learned how to surf. It was, it was awesome. Yeah. It was really great. Um, and I also, um, I primarily went to UCSD because I studied cognitive science. And I was a neuroscience researcher. And they have one of the best neuro programs in the world. And we'll get into like, I guess, why. But then I, as a, and, I, and I continued, I was a neuroscience researcher. I primarily focused on these cells in the brain called mirror neurons. So why we're having this conversation, why you're probably even interested to interview people, talk to them, connect, is because all mammalian species, humans and others, we have these uh, cells in our brain called mirror neurons. It, it enables us to be social, to want to connect, to form friendships, relationships. So I was really interested in social cognition for many reasons and that's what I studied I did my honors thesis on that I presented my own research uh, at a very famous conference called Society for Neuroscience so for a very long time my path was scientific I'm still really passionate about neuro and the brain and and it's fascinating and I wanted to study something also that wasn't available in Saudi at the time um, you know I thought oh my god if I'm going to go all the way to the U.S. 10,000 miles away might as well really you know d delve deep into something new interesting challenging um, and yeah but then um, I've always been big on doing things that really resonate with me to my truest form and to my core. So at 23, I started getting the idea of the accelerator for many reasons. And then I went all in. I, um, at the time I was working at Kidim too, full time, um, in their marketing department, leading partnerships and events. And I quit that job to start Blossom Accelerator full time. And since then haven't looked back. Before the exit or after? Before, before the exit. And it was, it was a, at the time, so maybe I'll, so I studied cognitive science, was a neuroscience researcher all throughout college, went on even after college, worked in clinical drug trials, uh, primarily research on the brain, still really passionate about it. Um, but I had this bug itching in me that I wanted to move back to Saudi um, and create really local impact here. I really always cared about that. Um, and uh, I decided to also pursue another passion, which was tech startups. I started two companies prior to Blossom. 
um, and quickly noticed that there was a gap in the ecosystem, whether it was in Silicon Valley or in Saudi, where one, there weren't enough women tech founders being funded, having enough support. We needed more females in the space. And two, still at the time in 2016, 2017, the startup ecosystem in Saudi was just developing. We've done so much in such a short amount of time. So I saw it as a golden opportunity and I was like, I want to innovate and pioneer in this industry and um it felt right and i just went for it and i literally never looked back six years pushing strong still going and we have many more things to to kind of blossom if you may Um, <clears throat> Blossom mm -hmm. uh, is the accelerator. Mm -hmm. That's where most of your time is dedicated to today. Yeah, I mean, I do a bunch of other things for sure. Multi-passion entrepreneur, but full-time Blossom accelerator. Um, um, I'm also a venture partner at an esteemed um, uh, venture capital firm. It's a London-based firm called Hambro Perks, and I specifically am a venture partner at Oryx Fund, which is an incredible MENA-based fund with offices in Riyadh. Um, I have a podcast as well, if you want to come on it. We mainly focus on inclusivity. Um, it's called Sharaf, which means passion in Arabic. Um, I would have told you that you had a podcast if you didn't tell me. Oh, really? I feel it. Wait, tell me why. Your answers and your talking jargon is so good that I can only imagine what you'd be like as a question asker oh, I or a conversationalist I like I think that. I spoke a maximum of 20 seconds in the first seven or eight minutes oh. which is a testament <laughs> uh, as to how Oops. good of a conversation no 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 this is this is a dream for me I, people don't want to hear me talk they're sick of hearing me talk they're probably sick of seeing me oh they gosh, see me for no. 66 episodes they want to see you oh. the subject um, and, uh, and and that's why I, I, I am not surprised that you have a, a podcast. Um, what is it that you guys, what is it, that you, what is it about? Um, so we focus, so <clears throat> like I mentioned before, so Blossom has this gender lens, this inclusivity lens. You know, we run accelerator programs, like I mentioned, focused on startups, uh, but our beneficiaries are, we really care for diverse teams. So because I'm so passionate about the gender lens and in the inclusivity space, naturally, I have a podcast that also focuses on female founders, women leaders. So we are the first podcast all in Arabic focused on women leaders and female founders and really heading, um, helping shed spotlight on their stories because uh, I'll be frank most of the podcasts that are related to business host a lot of men and there are now a lot of women in the space venture capitalists business women tech entrepreneurs raising millions in venture capital funding that are Saudi and I want those stories to be told and and we also host you know sometimes different female leaders that aren't necessarily always in business you know women in um, the Olympics uh, women in sports, women in art, an actress we recently hosted as well. And I'm just really passionate. I really believe, basically, you cannot be what you cannot see. And if a woman does it, sometimes that gives you encouragement. Oh, she did it? Oh, I can too. Mm -hmm. I really care about that. For me, growing up, I felt like I didn't have enough examples of local Saudi women pioneering. I'm sure that there were, but I just it, it wasn't out there. I didn't I didn't see it in the media. And for me, it always, you know, created this hunger, if you may, where I was like, I want to build something big one day. You know, do something of importance and and make impact. And uh, it's nothing like it. I mean, I know a lot of people sometimes are like, oh, women don't support other women. I don't, I don't believe that. I think that's a societal effect of, of other things, the glass ceiling effect. But when you create an inclusive, an inclusive space where everyone has equal opportunity to persevere and, and succeed, 
um, I think there's nothing like bonding with other women over shared experiences, whether it's imposter syndrome, you know me, my incessive need to be a perfectionist. So um, that's what Shagaf's about, talking about the stories and 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 sharing challenges and, and success together. Awesome. You uh, managed to attract the attention of Neom in mm-hmm. the Oxygen team. You're doing some work with them, you told me. Yes. Um, it ties into what they're doing there uh, as they gear up to Vision 2030. Yeah. Um, inclusive innovation. Yes. Can you talk to me a little bit more about Absolutely. that? Absolutely. Uh, so for those of you who don't know, Oxagon is a region in Neom really dedicated to the future of advanced and clean industries, pioneering innovation and thriving communities. And what we do as Boston Accelerator is we run our own accelerator programs, but then we also execute and operate programs for other entities. So Neom's Oxagon is one of them. And we have a really exciting opportunity coming up, which are two programs, Oxagon's Hackathon and Oxagon's Accelerator Program. Um, so for startups tuning in, if you have a, a company, a team, or you're an individual, this is a really great opportunity for you. Um, hopefully by the time this episode airs, applications, I believe, will still be open. Um, so the Hackathon is a three-day, very intensive event that takes takes place um, based out of Riyadh. And essentially, we're gravitating uh, exceptional individuals and form teams to participate in this three-day event. And what we do is we curate top-notch venture capitalists, investors, founders, subject matter experts, experts from Neom itself to come together and really enrich um, individuals' ideas further and their startups further through the three-day experience of a hackathon. Um, And then the top three finalists from the hackathon go on to attend the accelerator program, also based out of Riyadh, which will be three months long. So so you could be a finalist at the hackathon and attend that three-month accelerator where you get further support, access to financing, access to network. We say the MENA startup ecosystem really at your fingertips. Um, A lot of exciting opportunities to work closely also with Oxagon and Neo which is great, right? And we're focusing on four main sectors. So for anyone innovating in water innovation, e-fuels, green hydrogen, and technology, the service of people, if you're also looking to do something special with Neom, this would be the perfect opportunity. Um, Folks can apply directly to the hackathon or directly to the accelerator. They can also apply to both. Um, And this is one of the ways really, you know, uh, focus even on the industries that I mentioned. Um, These are also aligned with 2030 vision and diversifying away from the economy and focusing on startups and bringing to the region and to Saudi uh, a lot more innovation. So and, and the inclusive innovation part is really what it sounds like. Inclusive innovation. And there's so much research around this that um, the more diverse the team is, whether it's skill set, whether it's perspective, whether it's gender, you know, um, that those different insights, different brains brought to the team is what brings about more innovation, right? More new ideas being discussed, pushing the needle forward, and also more economic returns. There's a lot of research that shows that diverse teams, right? They're the ones that are able to solve the world's most pressing issues. So this is a core pillar of the Oxagon and all our programs that blossom, this inclusive innovation component. So whoever you are, we invite you to apply. We hope we want to meet you. We want to, we want to really empower you and give you all the tools needed so you can t- take it all the way. Yeah. You know what really got me going? Like what really got me excited? Because I'm already excited the moment I heard that the line is going to happen a year mm-hmm. ago. Um, and, and then you had the major unveiling about a month ago mm-hmm. where all you know th- these videos and images were just discussed by pretty much anyone who's interested in business or tech in the world and maybe even beyond that. Mm. But what really got me excited is seeing construction pictures underway. Mm. Like there was a picture, I'll try to find it. I think it was on an Instagram page by Saudi Projects. You could actually see the width of the line being drawn up in the sand. Tractors, earth movers, moving rock, actually almost penciling it into the sand. Yeah, And I'm like, you know, it's... This thing's underway. This thing's actually, it's no longer just an idea. This thing is under construction. It's no joke. Absolutely. And it's honestly, from all the projects in the world, this one excites me the most. Oh, do you know that Neom is actually, I believe, the same size or even larger than the whole country of Belgium? Wow. Like we are talking about, and that's, you know. 100, 100 miles, I think it was 162 kilometers. Yeah, it's miles. crazy. It's, yeah. it's, it's really, um, 
it, it's it's incredible and it's 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 a huge honor to be mm. you know working with them and the team and, and seeing the excitement and i can talk about it all day I know. and it's gotten a lot of attention of the people around the world because a lot of people are looking towards cleaner energy mm-hmm. um a future where i mean it makes sense if you look at manhattan how much of manhattan i would say i would say 30 percent of manhattan mm. is occupied by roads 30 percent that's Thir- a big number Huge. and i might be downplaying it yeah i mean that could be real estate absolutely so the idea came with you know cars or our transportation method was the reason why our cities are designed the way they are right so why don't we think not outside the box in a different stratosphere why do we need roads if the future right is clean energy and why do we need roads to get from a to b if everyone can live within a space of five minutes to get to your daily essentials oh, which is where the line comes in absolutely and i encourage anyone who you know is like oh it's the line you know and neom is doing spectacular things it, it really is and it's coming to life so quickly so you know it's that's the cool thing about living in saudi i think there was a there was a period of time where Saudis that studied abroad, when they would come back and move back after college, they were like, oh, I don't know. Like, I'm do, sad. Yeah. Now, yeah, yeah, yeah. it's like full force. full force. People can't wait. People are getting their MBAs here yeah. because they don't want to leave. Yeah, yeah. There's so much going on. It's like this incredible golden age for all industries, but specifically startup, investment, sustainability. Which so, takes me to a point, actually, that doesn't it feel that Riyadh is at the forefront of everything tech? Yeah. You talk about these hackathons, these... Uh, these tech companies that want to raise and they're looking, it's almost like, yeah, I would say the mean is epicenter Absolutely. for all things cyber, tech, the world of investment. Like it's Absolutely. forefront. Which is, which is also why I moved there. And even like, so I mentioned I'm a venture partner um, at a London-based VC asset management firm. They're called Hambro Perks. And they have 10 funds across uh, Europe and the Middle East. And so one of their funds, Oryx, is the fund that I'm a venture partner at. Their GPs are incredible. Like the whole team is is immensely. They're actually one of the very first um, international VCs to enter the Saudi market. And you mentioned Riyadh. They have offices based out of Riyadh. Um, and in terms of Riyadh being the capital of tech and investment, you know, um, I think almost 50 to 60% of their investments are Saudi-based companies. And they focus also on these other incredible industries that Saudi's thriving in. Ed tech, Mm -hmm. logistics, fintech, health tech, for seed stage companies all the way to series A. So um, it's really an exciting time. And also like when I go, you know, I live in Riyadh now before when I was based out of Jeddah, I would often travel. All the tech conferences, you know, FII, Future Investment Initiative, you know, which is which is part of PIF, Leap, GEC, all the huge, con- all the venture capitalists, I mean, all the huge uh, startups, they're all looking to move to Riyadh. And actually today, when you're not moving to Riyadh, you're kind of like, are they really serious as a startup? On the outside. Yeah, yeah. Are, they, yeah. are they really? It's like the Silicon Valley of the Middle East, yeah. if you may. So it's it's really exciting um, on that front too. I've had a lot of friends ask me, uh, saying, Mo, when are you moving to Riyadh? I'm like, I'm not. They're like, no, you are. You just don't know it yet. Yeah. I'm like, oh, it's like that. <laughs> yeah, it's, it's, it's like that. But 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 it's exciting. And I and um, I mean, Jeddah is so close. Like, it's an hour and a half flight. It's really not that big of a deal. You know? It's nice to have a train to connect the two. And I think there's one. They're working on it. Yeah, yeah. They're working on it. Yeah. So if, if you're listening and you want to come to Saudi, visit Riyadh. <laughs> visit Jeddah too. We're from Jeddah. Beautiful, beautiful city on the Red Sea. I'm sure you and I both, like anyone from Jeddah, grew up snorkeling, grew yeah. up jet skiing, yeah. grew up diving. So, you know, you kind of get the bu- best good of energy. both. Good All energy. good energy. Yeah. Nothing like the, uh, the, nat- the nature of the beach and the beautiful coastline we have here. Yeah. Um, you did a TEDx talk? Yes, I did. Tell me about it. Um, okay. So back to, I studied cognitive science and I was a neuroscience researcher at the University of California, San Diego. And my TEDx talk was... You keep saying San Diego, I'm going to cry. <laughs> All right. It's, it's a city very dear to my heart. So let that be the last time you say it. <laughs> I'll try my best. No promises, but I'll try. I'm just um, Yeah. So I... I um, I got the opportunity to have, to have a TEDx talk and it was a no-brainer. They said, what do you want to talk about? And it was my first time talking about this publicly, um, but essentially why I majored in the brain 
and went on to study it um, and research it because I grew up my whole life with epilepsy. I still have epilepsy. I have I've had seizures ever since I could remember. I could remember back to the age of four, had them actively like 50 plus seizures every single day, day in, day out till I was like 23, 24. So anyone I went to school with who knows me, remembers me, knows, I mean, they, they've seen me have many seizures. How long do they last for? Um, it depends on the kinds of seizures, but it could last up to three minutes. And during which you lose complete sensation, you can't hear, you can't see, you can't feel, you lose all sense of time. Almost like fainting, huh? You lose your motor skills, you're completely unconscious. You have no idea what's happening, the world around you. And it, it shaped so much of my personality. So actually the TEDx talk is called How to Have Superpowers. And I hope to write a book one day called Saudi Superman from seizures to superpowers. And that's how I look at my at my seizures and, and my epilepsy. And I'm so proud actually of being an entrepreneur and a and a venture capitalist with a disability. And I and I I think it's not talked enough about well, when we talk about inclusive innovation, when we talk about including uh, different demographics in all aspects of society, I think we should also talk about, there's so many ranges, like there's people who have autism, Asperger's, OCD, ADHD, these people, I want their I want them to feel the confidence to share their story. So for me, that TEDx talk was essentially about my experience growing up with epilepsy, battling it over 50 plus seizures a day, and how I never let it stop me, and it, how it morphed all the passion. And, and it's also why I do so much work in the inclusivity space. Like Blossom is female focused and tech inclusion. And that whole part is because obviously growing up with a disability anywhere, you feel extremely excluded. Obviously, there's a lot of bullying. You know, you have to learn to navigate the world differently. That's how I also became a good public speaker or speaker at all. Because when I would live on the daily and just I'd have so many seizures, every single time I'd talk, have a sentence. I even remember after college when I'd interview for jobs, like throughout the interviews, I'd have a bunch of seizures. It was so embarrassing. But I had to build this, res I had to build, I had to become an extra better speaker. So then when I get out of the seizure, I almost comfort the person speaking to me so they don't freak out and they also still believe and think that I'm a capable person. That's literally one of the number one reasons why I learned to speak really well and, and gather myself and, and have confidence. So um, you push yourself. Oh, to the, to the, to the limit. Um, I also, so I've been on two magazine covers. Um, the first one was uh, the cover of Harper's Bazaar, Arabia, um, with Will I Am and, uh, and uh, Sad Al Madini. That was, that was a crazy, crazy, crazy experience. And, and, I, and I, a lot of what I um, dedicated inside the magazine speaking about was my epilepsy. Um, and I remember also Blossom in an inclusivity space, but I really, really wanted to talk about growing up with seizures because I remember as a kid thinking, gosh, why do I have this? Like, seriously, God could have picked anyone else. Like, there were, there were times, you know, you feel really low and you're like, this is horrible for a very long time. It was really hard to control them, you know? And so I wrote in this like little notebook I had as a kid. I was like, one day I have seizures. I know, and I have seizures because one day I'm going to talk about them. I'm going to share my story. It's going to help other people you thought that, that are struggling. Back, back then, yeah, huh? when I was like eight or nine, I thought that. So I feel like... It's very optimistic of you. I have really optimistic parents, super optimistic. My dad is like, like, a, like glass always half full. And I think that also really helped me. My mom is also super caring and encouraging. I, I think I definitely view myself or hopefully people will say about me, I'm pretty positive. And that's how you have to like live life. I mean, that's the only way to truly succeed because life can be very stressful and there's a lot of curveballs and unpredicted elements. And, you know, the only thing you can control is your reaction. So that's what I made sure I, I controlled. And, and so in my, in my TEDx talk, it's in Arabic. So I'll just recap a quick portion. Is it on YouTube? It is on YouTube. I'm going to put it in the show notes. Okay, that'd be amazing. Um, so I talk about three things, basically how I have three superpowers, how um, I can stop time, how I'm the strongest person I know, I have superwoman strength, and how I can fly. And to learn more, I guess you have to you have to watch the TEDx talk. But in in every meaning of of those three superpowers, I really do believe like if it wasn't for my seizures, I'd probably be quite boring. <laughs> I've never heard of someone speak about the experience of seizures. Um, that's why I don't know how to react to uh, what you just said. It's not even in the notes that we you know put for this. Um, but what I can tell you is that it's. Um, super wise of you to at the time where you feel like your world is crumbling mm. instead of saying you know why 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 you were thinking 
uh, how can this perhaps help me one day to be the best version of myself or just to use this as leverage one day right and um as someone once said very smart guy said your resume is a collection of all your sufferings mm, i love that mm. i love that i always have these uh and that one guy is naval okay and he said that and i was like wow I think I am who I am because of what I've suffered. Of course. A thousand percent. Of course. Of course. Even, even you don't my, learn from easy. Oh, no, you don't. No. And and um, I'm grateful for, for, for every single time I cried or I felt left out because it helped me also think really introspectively mm-hmm. about the world around me and why things, you know, 50 million people around the world have epilepsy. And I'm sure like 50, less than huh? 50, zero. Five wow. zero. I'm sure less than 1% would feel confident to talk about it out loud. And I want to like crush it. I want to be like, you know, it's a, it's, I always talk about, well, first of all, I'm proud I, to say the word disability. I don't think it's a dirty word. I think I'm proud to have it. Like there was a time obviously where it's like, oh, shh, don't talk about it. Like, you know, you don't want to, you don't want people to think negatively about you. But I'm like, no, that's why, that's why I'm special. Like yes, yeah. the, 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 I also have really bad vision because of my seizures. Like, I just don't see the world the same way other people do. Like, there's some colors I can't see. But do, I always... Do you drive? I do not drive. You don't drive. I do not drive. One day. Um, you want to. I'm like a CEO. I get driven around, Mo. <laughs> you gotta you gotta switch it up. Look at, you know... Day change, one CEO. Change, change the way you view it, right? <laughs> Um, but I always, I always joke like, okay, I can't see that well, but I got, I got 20, 20 vision. I got 20, 30 vision. I'm a visionary. Although I can't see, you know, it helps me because sometimes if I'm walking somewhere and I obviously sometimes people like will wave and I won't see them, even if I'm wearing glasses, even wearing contacts, but I just joke about it. Like can't see my haters Mm -hmm. or like, you know, can see like the, the long-term vision. That's all that matters as long as I can see the vision. Um, and yeah, you just have to make the best out of everything in life. Life is beautiful and fragile and short and and, and it, oh i love growing up with with a disability too because it helped me really early on in life m- mature realize what i want understand purpose or my impact or like what i actually care about i couldn't have been doing my company for six years at 23 starting an accelerator as a young solo female founder I mean, the grit to keep doing that at a time where the startup ecosystem was still super developing, talking about inclusivity and female founders and the and the gender funding gap as a 23 year old. I couldn't have had the grit to continue that because there were so many people who doubted or like unless I went through that experience. Unless you you suffered from that, if we can use that word. Oh, you struck you like it was something that you had to deal with that many people didn't. Yeah. So you're 28 now, 29. I am 29 now. Started the company at 23. So I think if it wasn't for what you've been through, you wouldn't have accomplished what you've accomplished so far that many people who are 39, maybe even 49, yeah. haven't yeah. accomplished what you have. So the net is a proper gain. Yeah. And I'm and I'm just getting started. I have so much, I don't know if you can tell, I have so much fire in me. Like I, I wake up every day and I really have a lot of drive. Good. I'm like, what else can I do? Yep. You know, what other investments can we curate? What other companies are interesting? You know, um, I want to see a lot of unicorns come out of Saudi. IPOs, you know, more acquisitions, more exits, a healthier startup ecosystem. I want, I want more people to listen to this podcast and, and say, oh, well, Saudi's up to some really interesting work. Yep. You know, we should come there. We should invest there. Uh, all these things make me really passionate. Mm. What's the saying? Hard work beats what every time? Talent. You betcha. Talk to me about uh, Davos. 24 years old, they invited you. How? I want to go to Davos. I want to be invited. <laughs> How did that happen? Okay. So you should know Unfair. something. Yeah, I should know something about me. So um, anything I put my mind to, I think I, I go. Like if I, if I put my mind to it, it's happening. Good. So when I was 23, around the same time I was thinking of starting Blossom, um, my dad sent me a video of Jack Ma, founder of Alibaba, speaking at the World Economic Forum. And he was like, my, my baby, like, I hope one day you get to go to Davos. And I was like, yeah, dad, sure. Like everyone wants to go to Davos. It's like the foremost, largest gathering, most important conference meeting with like CEOs and presidents. Like, how am I going to go? He's like, one day you're going to go and you're going to be on a stage and you're going to talk about your company. And so you can tell by my parents, both my mom and my dad, they're, they're huge people who are like dream big you can do it and at the time i just shrugged it off i was like how am i gonna go to davos like you know same reaction anyone would have like yeah okay sure 
And then, um, and then after that conversation, I was like, seriously, how, like, I would love to go to Davos. I um, first, like, this idea of, like, I know that I have a lot of things to bring to the table to talk about unique insights about Saudi, about the startup ecosystem. So I, I had that inherent self-worth. And then I started doing research. I literally Googled how to go to the World Economic Forum. I, I came across a lot of articles, but essentially it brought me to um, this youth initiative of the World Economic Forum called the Global Shapers Community. If you are in your 20s, go check it out. Uh, so the Global Shapers Community um, is a network of hubs around the world. They have a Jeddah hub, they have a Riyadh hub, they have a Khobar hub, hubs everywhere. And it doesn't guarantee at all like any kind of invitation to go to Davos or any World Economic Forum. Um, but I, I thought it was an exciting initiative. I, it's a volunteer-based initiative. So you create like local projects in your city that are for impact. And um, it's it's tied or associated with the World Economic Forum. So I was like, you know, this is a great you know way to meet other motivated, talented young people, work with them. So I joined them in, uh, in actually... It was it was August 2017. I officially joined them. There were some interviews you have to pass, some projects you have to do, and then a month later, to the date of my dad saying, uh, a year later. So a month later was September. I joined in August. A month later, September 2017 was a year to the date of my dad saying, "My daughter, my baby, I really hope you go to Davos." I got an official invitation from the World Economic Forum. I was selected amongst 50 global shapers from around the world. We're a, f- a group of 15,000 um, to go and represent Saudi and represent my local community. And I shortly did speak about my company and I did meet Jack Ma. I have a picture of him on my Instagram. I met Bill Gates. I spoke to Jack about what I'm doing as well. And it was in every sense of the word, a full circle moment. I went on to get invited to World Economic Forum Tianjin in, in China, World Economic Forum in Mina, in Jordan on the on the Dead Sea. And um, that's crazy. I know it, it is. But I but I believe in this energy. You worked for it. I did. And, and and it wasn't like at that point, like after I found out about Global Shapers, I wasn't fixated so much on Davos. I just, I guess I was taken in the moment by the work that we we're doing. It's a really exciting like community of young people. Everyone's smart. Everyone has something to offer. Um, and I think also half of success is not just showing up, but believing in yourself, like this inherent self-worth. Because if you don't have it, yeah. no, you're nothing. You, you, yeah. then you, you, you can't it's really, you If know. you don't believe in yourself, no one else will. No one else will. And my name is... Iman, yeah. Iman, yeah. I'm which means nice faith, faith, which means faith, like believing in oneself. So I think it was always an intrinsic part of who I am. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Amazing. Fantastic. I know. So I it was pretty crazy. Yeah. yeah. <clears throat> Mom and dad, what kind of uh, role did they play in your life? Super supportive. Just um, always g- gave me and my brother infinite love. Um, my parents were never the kind of parents that were like, you got to get A's. You got to be the best. You got to be number one. But you did that anyway. I did that anyway because there was absolutely no pressure. It was like, you're mm-hmm. the best anyway. Like, you know, my parents always ingrained in me, just be yourself. Just be yourself and everything else will follow. Do something you love. Like, definitely they weren't the strict parents. And I don't know, it worked for me and my brother. Um, and always really, really supportive. Like I told my dad, I want to study cognitive science. I don't think he knew what that was. I want to be a neuroscience researcher. He's like, sounds good. Okay. Yeah, sure. And my dad actually used to make fun of me when I was in, when I was in school, like the, how I used to, how much I used to study. He used to be like, are you getting a PhD? You're, you're a teenager. You should, you should like not study this much. Like you're putting, pulling too many all nighters. Um, but I think I always had that grit and tenacity given the fact that I like, obviously grew up with challenges societally that were really difficult for me, but they're just really loving. And, and they fully, they always tell me like we sit together and we, you know, the vision board, I sit with my parents and we have like vision board sessions. They're like, you're gonna, you know, I tell them like what I want and they start feeding me ideas. I joke like not forward facing, but definitely internally in the home. Like my mom is like my momager. My dad is like a dadager. I coined my dad like, and also sometimes like my dad's a, as, as a, as a successful businessman. So often we're at the same conferences and he, he really makes me feel like he's my dadager. Like we went to FII, he got invited separately for his company. I got it invited separately for Blossom Accelerator and the work that I'm doing. And so we were at the conference together. And so obviously we like hung out at the conference during FII. For people who don't know, FII is like Davos in the desert. It's like the most foremost, most important um, event that happens in the Middle East with gathering of ministers and heads of states and business CEOs, related, business, yeah. re- investment related um, by PIF, by the Public Investment Fund. And so at that, at that conference, my dad was like, oh, 
that's so and so you should go you should go say oh that and and we were actually both feeding on each other so really grateful Super. apple doesn't fall far from the tree huh? i guess not i guess not but i but i think like my my parents tell me that's the cool thing about having kids is that like my brother and i are like 10 times better than them that's what they say mm -hmm. and like your kids are like the better version of you but yeah i wouldn't be anywhere anywhere like support is everything i grew up with a lot of support that is a privilege that i fully understand that i've had and they, they are my parents what about mom oh my mom is fun and sweet and caring and alive my mom is one of the most alive people i know on the face of the planet she is uh, and, and she gives me my energy like you know just waking up you know grinding hustling every day and also being happy being super optimistic while you do it i never feel or it's very seldom not never but seldom that i feel like ugh, like it's been such a long day i'm doing so much i'm traveling so much i'm tired uh, my mom always instilled in me like every everything you're doing like be be enriched in gratitude. If you're having a latte in the morning with like coconut, soy milk, almond milk, you're already living like one of the best lives on earth. You have access to internet. You have access to information. There is nothing. You have your health. You have your health. And I do, even, even with a disability, I have my health. I'm here. I'm, I'm, I'm able to do things. So that really um, championed me and always taught me to be very uh, confident as well. Gratitude, huh? When you said gratitude, you reminded me of a movie yesterday I watched called Father Stew. Um, Mark Wahlberg, I, th I think it was a good one. Um, he plays a role of a guy who loses his ability to walk. He becomes paralyzed. Mm. And um, there was a scene where he's in a hospital bed and he attempts to stand, but his legs fail him. Mm. And I said, wow, how many times a day do we go from sitting to standing without thinking or being appreciative of the fact that we are able to stand? Absolutely. And uh, I think that was like one of the most things I've realized that I take for granted, mm. that my limbs work. You know, we talk about having money. We talk about having uh, education, right. safety. We, we talk about those things and we right. appreciate that. Yeah. But working limbs. Right. You know what, I, you know what I'm grateful for? A healthy body when I get a paper cut. Oh wow! I I think that's also where, again, like growing up with any challenge really teaches you a lot. Like on the daily for nearly twenty years, every single day I would lose all my five senses. I would often lose my motor function because if you have a seizure, you can't walk. Your body just, you know, you have convulsions and you have to. I'd be I would be woken up at a hospital somewhere. But I would always continue studying. I was always an A. A plus student. I always I worked from day one of me being in college. I've always been a go getter, and I think it it gave me that discipline and that drive, and also like this greater understanding. Like, why do I have this? There's a greater meaning at play. I am uniquely designed to take on this mission of inclusivity. I'm, I'm a I'm a young woman who grew up in Saudi in the 90s who has a disability. Like that was the narrative I told myself. Like I'm uniquely positioned, and like you know. To do this and and then when you feel that you you know have this narrative and story that drives you it makes everything you do make so much more sense so that that's really what helped guide yeah. me so much after everything it coming full circle um you know you managed to execute and get what you initially wanted to i think so far you probably achieved a big portion of your dream yeah are you happy I think like the the word happy is like, you know, has been popularized in the last 300 years. I feel like talking so much about happiness could actually make everyone more unhappy. How would you define it? Today? I would I would I would say I'm I'm ingrained in, in my gratitude in the small things. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's great having the billboards and being on national campaigns and the magazine covers, et cetera, et cetera. But for me, it's about the journey. So if happiness for me is being ingrained in everyday gratitude and being content, being content and and appreciating the low, because if you then you would never be happy, you'd never appreciate the high and happiness also because, you know, I think a lot of people listening in might not be happy. And so that, that's that's a truth. Like the, the world is actually getting a little less happy um, by statistics. Do you believe it's a choice? 
I think some of it is neurochemicals in the brain. From within. Like people if you are, choose some, to be happy, you'll see everything. Well, no, I, I think it, like it's it's a little bit nurture, a little bit nature. Like some people are predispositioned in their biochemistry, you know, that they would be often way more likely to have anxiety, depression, you know, than other people. So I think just saying, oh, well, it's just a choice. Like, just become happy. Yalla just become happy. I think that's definitely um, minimizing sometimes other people's pain. But I will say the number one thing, if we will talk about happiness, is for me, the mindset of gratitude. And gratitude, yeah. gratitude. And there's, I always say, when people tell me no, I say no to their no. Like, if I really want it, I'm going to go make it happen. You know, and I think that's one of the best, earliest lessons I've learned is if you want something done, you can get up and roll up your sleeves and go ahead and do it yourself. And that feeling is so empowering. Oh, the feeling of as an entrepreneur, if you want, if you want to talk about money, the feeling of you have an idea, you created it into a service or product, and people pay you for this continuously. You have acquisition and you have retention. The idea of like when I first saw money hit my bank account. One second, my close up just died. Okay. Um. Sorry guys, we had a problem with one of my close-ups, so uh, I'm gonna I'm gonna test Iman's memory to see if she knew where we were. I last was speaking about um, we were talking about gratitude. Wait, wait, I was gonna tell. I'll tell you where I was. I have a point, and then I want you to follow up. Bounce. On it. Okay, that's fine. Okay. Yeah. I believe, and I read this. I believe that the world reflects your feelings back at you. Hmm. If you leave the house in the morning and everything is great, within reason, you're going to get that in return. Right. But the moment you leave your house, and if you're like, oh my God, I'm sick of this car, it's old. Oh my God, I'm sick of my it's hot. job. I have to go Ugh, here, and yeah. the driving, and this and that. I agree with that. Because I made a decision recently that no matter what happens, I'm not going to let it bother me. Why? Because... Isn't it life is 10% of what happens to you, 90% of how you react to it? For sure. When I recognized that, I became happier. You know what my biggest life hack is? What? I go to bed every night and I say, tomorrow is going to be the best day of my life. That's it. And then I wake up and I'm like, oh my God, I'm excited. Today is going to be the best day of my life. And I do that every day. And it's, every easy, it's, day. Easy, it's easy to... To, to not say that, to, to, to be worried, mm. to be apprehensive, to be anxious of what tomorrow can bring. The happiest time of the day for me, I don't know about you, but it's in the morning when mm. I wake up, those first two hours, mm. because there's one thing that comes to mind, possibilities. Yeah. Yeah, yeah I, I would say for sure, ha mornings are definitely happiest. Um, but I also love, like I'm sure you get into these moments, like the, the late night hustle when you have music on, you make like a a coffee you're knowing it's going to be a, an all-nighter or a very late night and you get into this beautiful creative space where you're just like have and, and you're not getting as many like messages or anything emails it kind of the world kind of slows down and just you have time to like zone in and focus clearly you can see that i like working by night um, not a morning person i am but but um sometimes i'll sleep in the extra hours and stay up in the evening i'll I work best when my energy is the highest so I can and, and when people aren't like blowing up my WhatsApp and emails. So I have time to really envision my future, think about strategy. That's one of my favorite things to do. Think about the long term, bigger strategy and everything that I want to do. Who are my beneficiaries? What gift services, skills can I provide to them? And 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 as best as I can help all of those moving pieces align. Um I like doing that on the weekend. I don't know. I, I nerd out on the weekend. That's what I like doing. Yeah. When everyone's, you know, doing something else, you're focusing on your grind and your craft. I love it. I, I um, yeah, I don't know. The like the, the art of uh, manifesting, visualization. I'm, I'm definitely a huge, a huge advocate of that. What scares you? Hmm. I mean, probably probably not uh, fully doing all the things that I want to do on earth. You know, I have a, a very specific specific and elaborative, a very specific and elaborate vision, Mo. So, you know, it, it would scare me. It scares me to think, oh, like, what if I, I, I don't do, like you, th like you might think, or the, like anyone, 
like listening might think, oh, well, you've already accomplished so much and you're 29. But for me, it's like, oh, I this, this, and nothing. Like for me, it's still the beginning. There's so much more I want to do. There's so many more things I want to do for the inclusivity space, closing the VC gender funding gap, more people, uh, more things for people with epilepsy, with other people with disability. I want to, so many things, create generational wealth, um, directly impact more people. So my fear is like, I, I, what if I, you know, that, that, that dark thought, but just got to keep your head high and keep pushing and, and just be grounded in this moment that we have. Mm -hmm. It's everything. It's everything. Stay in the moment. Yeah. Yeah. To be in the moment. And sometimes you just have to put some like good rap music on, put on a headset and just sit down and like get into the work and like, you just need that, that momentum to kick you back into if you're having like a lazy day or you're procrastinating you're, and, and fear is the biggest thing that holds you back, you know? So I, I need to, I read this an amazing book by Oprah Gift. Winfrey. Oh, I was going to say, wait, is wait. it called The Gift of Fear? No. It, um, yeah, it's, um, uh, it's, um, I think it's called, what would you do if you weren't afraid? Oh, it was another book I read of hers. Or uh, maybe it's, well, what's the name of the book that you read? Um, it is what I know for sure. It is what I know for sure. You're right. But she kept having in the book saying, what would you do if you weren't afraid? What would you do if you weren't afraid? And so I like to always come from that mindset. And the biggest thing is, um, you know, given that we're living this era of mental health and self-awareness, the best thing is to just be self-aware about your insecurities, about your fears. And so every single time I'm, I'm fearful, I'm like, okay, I vocalize to myself. I vocalize to myself like, okay, this is a fear and I'm going to be aware of it so I can take a step back so I can then take tech 10 steps forward. Yeah. Yeah. A favorite and least favorite thing about yourself? Least favorite is, and you know, I can tend to be like an, an extreme perfectionist. I need to let it go sometimes. Is it a bad thing? It can be, yeah, because especially in the world of science or startups, there's no like there's no such thing as perfection. It's you iterate, you fail, you pivot, you try again, you test. This customer segment doesn't work. You switch over to the next one. You planned on using your pre-seed investment for this. It ends up using it for that. There's a lot of things that you have to be prepared for. And, and sometimes perfection has you plan more and execute less. And so, or or get just caught up in your own anxiety. Oh, I did this. What if that person thought that? Da, 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 da. Like you create all these stories in your head about what happened at that meeting during the day. Da, 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 da. And so I don't think it's a great thing. I think I should really just um, let go of it completely or as much as I can. Um, Do you meditate? I don't necessarily meditate within the traditional word, like yogi in a room, meditation, quiet. I'll be honest with you. Yeah. I feel that per, a, a personality like yours is on the higher spectrum of people who need it. Oh. And, and, and I put myself in that as well. I've calmed down, you know, with age, but I was just like you, you know, always wanting to move, do, sit. Like I, my mom literally thought there were ants in my pants. <laughs> if, uh, I, I've, I've been there. Yeah. Um, and, and it just kind of grounds you yeah. a little bit, gives you more mental clarity. I have to say, I don't, I don't love, like I've tried meditation, given my personality and my oomph and fire, uh, I didn't love it, but I do, the only thing that calms me down and like, I really, really love is swimming in, in the, nice. in either in the Red Sea, the ocean, I just love water does something to me. Yeah. Um, so that's maybe my form of meditation. That's why I said it's not the traditional, you know. Well, wait. what's meditation? How do you define it? How would you practice it? Because it's a lot simpler than what you think it is. Mm. So for me, meditation is sitting in silence within my thoughts and letting things go and um, accepting, acceptance, yeah. completely accepting whatever it is Thirty minutes going to happen and, next. And just watching your thoughts. Look at where the mind goes. Mm. That alone. it's cha it's re It rewires your brain. Mm. Oh, for sure. Super important. Because, I mean, we are at the mercy of our notifications on our phone. Yeah. For anyone tuning into that's that hasn't hit 25, 
you can literally rewire a brain. That's when your brain is the most malleable and flexible. So you can literally change so many things about yourself that you want to work on, maybe that you dislike about yourself, especially by 25, because the last growth spurts of your brain are 25, 26. And that's what some, that's something I was really aware of. There's a, a really great TED Talk called um, Why 30 is Not the New 20, essentially. And she talks about how... Um, a lot of people are pushing things later in life. Like it's like, oh, I don't have to get a job now. I don't have to start a startup now. I don't have to do this now. I don't have to take responsibility now. Because anyway, everything is happening later. People are getting married later. People are studying longer. People are getting employed later. Everything is happening later. And so you, it gives you this perception that you all have an extra 10 years. Um, and so she talks about how actually that's not the right mindset to have. You should start really early and think about things and challenge yourself and 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 rewire your brain early on because it is harder to rewire later the earlier the better hmm. that but you think you asked also the best thing i like about myself yes i did um I have a good memory my friends would would tell you that i'm sassy and confident would you agree with your friends i would agree with my friends and i think it gives me that that fire like to believe and and i execute on everything i say i'm gonna do i never sign up for something and leave it half you know halfway there so um and and i i, I definitely have um great you know self-belief in myself and i think that that's my probably my favorite thing i have my days where i'm insecure and I look in the mirror and i'm like oh, why this is not my day i want to cry just like huddle into a puddle and like just sit there and like close all the windows like no this is no yeah i have those days um do you, do you ever say yes when you want to say no i have for sure i i'm definitely in the practice of no longer doing that and for me like saying no is it's you have to i have that to learn it i think that in the beginning especially when you want when i when, you know the beginning of starting a business and especially being young and you care about people's opinion and their validation and oh my god da, 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 da. um so in the beginning i think i said more yeses than i should have but now i'm just kind of cutthroat if it's not working for me if it doesn't match the values that you know are my company entails and what my team hardly work for and you know then no and if it if it's grasping too much of my time and energy and that other person you know, it could even be a friend, isn't being respectful, like, you know, a no is definitely then, yeah, I'll just all say no. But yeah, it was it was a struggle at first. I think for many people, it, it, it still is. Mm -hmm. uh, they say, watch your life improve the more you say no to things. Yeah. Well, I, I said before, I say no to people's no's. Mm -hmm. yeah, you, I'm sure you've, you've gotten a lot of Forget no's. about people's no's, but people that want something of you. Yeah. Uh, it, uh, yeah, I mean, the question can be reformulated as, are you a people pleaser? I think I used to be. I think now I'm really just fixated on myself, my vision, and and um, and going all the way with it, and and knowing that actually, Iman, by you saying yes to things and putting more on your plate with things that don't serve you, you're actually just going to take longer to get there. So it's okay. Like rip off the bandaid and say no. They'll they'll live. They'll be okay. <laughs> totally. Well said. How do you feel about the schooling system today? Do you feel that there is a subject that is not being taught there that should be taught there? Yeah, absolutely. What subject? Um, how to make money. How to make money. How to make money. Like when I tell you, because you know, if, 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 if most of your life you've been an employee and you get that monthly salary that hits your bank at the end of the month, you it really numbs you. You become... Like that becomes your comfort zone. And I don't think, and I think everyone should maybe have at least a year of their life where they challenge themselves and they say, I'm going to create money. Like I'm going to either whatever passion problem I want to solve, if there's a market for it, I'm going to dedicate this year to making this a product or service and I'm going to monetize it. There is nothing like that, like that feeling. And honestly, it's a very powerful feeling. I remember when I closed one of my first deals um at the company at blossom and even for companies prior um it was like oh my god i just did that how much more can i do how can i do this more efficiently how can i scale it 
you know, who should I employ? Where should I first, where, how should I use this revenue so it can be most profitable? It opens up your mind to so many more things. It helps you also understand there's this really great book that I read, Smart Women um, Finish Rich, which, is, which talks about the importance of women being able to make their own money, manage their own money, because on average, men do disease 10 years earlier than women. So most likely women will have a partner and a husband that diseases earlier. And traditionally around the world, men are mostly in charge of the finances, which leaves the woman, now a widow, grieving not only the loss of her husband, now with so much responsibility, but also this financial burden that she was never fully you know, prepared for. So I think learning that early is super important. Um, and maybe a second thing, because I have to add in my second thing. Um, <laughs> And also a second thing, because, you know, I got to sneak in my second point. I, I think there should be more lessons at schools about the importance of equity, inclusivity, diversity. Anyone going to school today, right, regardless of gender, background, ethnicity, skill set, that you've got a lot of different people in one classroom. And I think people should learn from an earlier age, students and teachers, everyone around us in the world, and this should be taught in schools, the importance of befriending people that are different from you, learning from different perspectives. Diversity, yeah. It's so important. It expands your brain. I mean, it, it's and I think that was one of the greatest things about studying abroad is meeting people so different from me, from backgrounds. It also teaches you, it's good to be, it teaches you to be well-rounded and understand and, and, and grasp the world differently. And so... Um, and also, yeah, it teaches you also self-acceptance. Of When you self-accept others, you better self-accept yourself. Correct, correct. And tolerance. Tolerance. Yeah. yeah. Andre discussed. Most valuable lesson you've ever learned in your life? Hmm. I mean, I think we've covered it in a capacity, but... If you don't believe in yourself, no one else will. No one's here to save you. No one's here to save you. You got to do it. I live by that, by the way. So important. No one is here to save you. If you don't build it, no one's coming for you. No one's coming for you. No one's going to magically give it to you. You know, if you think, oh, when I get married, I'll start it. When I graduate, when I finish my master's degree, I have to have at least five years experience in this corporate. Bullshit. Nothing. No one's coming to save you, yeah. but you. Start. And and as soon as you get into that mindset, the world expands yeah. and changes in service of you yeah. and your dreams and your vision and your goal. Um, so it's actually a great, powerful thing to learn and, and also teach you uh, independence. I'm also really fascinated by the concept of power. I always have been. I think I've talked to you before about secondhand power. Yeah. So I believe... Growing up, obviously, most people that were in these like leadership position roles were always men. And I always were like, where, where are other examples of like amazing Saudi women or Arab women? Or even like globally, there weren't that many women like what we had Oprah on TV, but there wasn't that many. Right. And I always thought, OK, women who seem to be have this notion of power, whether it's tied to influence or wealth or you know, or money, it always seemed to be like maybe it was inherited or they married into it. So it wasn't directly theirs. And I became really passionate about this idea of what is power. And they can mean different things to different people. How do you gain it? How do you create it yourself? So it's something that you always own. And I also, with that power and, and you know, getting things done yourself, no one's here to save you. Really am passionate about this idea of building generational wealth. I talk a lot about it with my friends. I want to be that great, 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 great grandmother that left down legacy, legacy, impact, access to opportunities for generations to come. I don't know. I think I'll like write like a, a manual book of all the gaps that I see in society, whether it's sustainability, whether it's equity and inclusion, whether it's things in the workplace, things in the places we should invest in more. And, you know, I'll pass that down to my kids to pass down to the kids, 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 you know, so they get some insight and hopefully I'm able to like leave them also a lot of money so they can with that money do more things. And I, and I, oh, I love this concept that money is not a bad thing. I don't know why people like some people really genuinely think that money is bad. It's said that those who don't have much of it. 
I think that's, feel that way about it. Yeah. yeah. And I think people should change their mindset about it because it's not about, it's not the money. It's you as a person. If you're a great person, oh God, how much more would you donate? Yeah. How much more could you serve with that? Right. Um, so I'm huge and really passionate about that as well. Mm-hmm. Yeah. What's, uh, what's next for you the next five years? Where do you see yourself? More in the venture capital space, doing really exciting things. Um, with Oryx Hambro Perks, scaling Blossom to new heights. Stay tuned. We're definitely working on some major expansion plans to other parts of the GCC and MENA. Um, I'm really passionate about um, sharing my thoughts and knowledge. So probably other podcasts, other platforms are able to speak and share and you know learn also from spectacular individuals. Um, definitely become a more active angel investor. Um, I am an angel investor at the moment. I didn't know that. I didn't I, know that was part of your uh, umbrella. Um, newly to it, just invested in a few companies, but definitely want to add to it. Awesome. And it le- and it ties into you know the whole startup VC uh, space as well. Um, and uh, and that's the awesome thing about investing, right? Obviously, you have to get to a point of understanding to start investing in startups. But the most amazing thing about it is if you're a multi-passionate person, if you consider yourself a multi-potentialite, you don't have the time to dabble in all the things you love. But if you align yourself with an incredible team and incredible founders that are building something and they you allow them to obviously take the full lead on that, but you're still able to be, even if it's a small part of their journey. So I think that's one of the most, and it's so important that women invest to, to also close that um, that gap, you know, not enough. You know that two percent of all venture capital funding in the whole world goes to women. That's terrible. That number needs to be up to thirty. And actually, the number of female entrepreneurs are nearly half around the world. So if half of the entrepreneurs are male and half the entrepreneurs are women, but only two percent of the funding are going to ideas and startups led by women, I'm really I'm really passionate about solving that gap. And there's many nuances as to why it's a global phenomena and, and, and problem. But that's also one of the things that's that's coming up for me soon. I, I want to have left this world, either already solved that or have made ways coming sooner to, to solving it more quickly. Yeah. 